Good morning. This is Senate Health and Welfare. It's January 14th, and this is our meeting today. We're, we're picking up some testimony that we were unable to hear uh, when we went through S-74 uh, initially, and then we are going to move on to our a proposed bill that Katie McClinn has put together for us on uh, mask requirements, masking policy. Uh, and then after that, we'll hear from uh, the Department of Health, Mark Levine and Patsy Kelso, who are here, um, who are not here yet, uh, and others. So uh, we may not get to S90 or S19, which are on the agenda for today. Um, they will be preempted by our other discussions. <clears throat> if we do get to them, it will be at the end of the meeting. So good morning, Mary. Thank you for being here with us this morning. And uh, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself for the record and then provide testimony. Well, good morning, Senator Lyons. Thank you for this opportunity and good morning to all the members of the Health, Senate Health and Welfare Committee. I am Mary Han Beerworth and I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Right to Life Committee. So I apologize for delaying this testimony and I'll get right to it if that's all right with all of you. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish to also thank Aaron Dunamore for his help with posting of materials. I do live remotely, so I'm gonna be reading from a different screen. Uh, I have no internet where I am. Uh, Vermont Right to Life joined with others to oppose passage of what is currently known as Act 39. Those organizations in opposition included the Vermont Alliance for Ethical Healthcare, an organization formed by Vermont healthcare professionals, along with some of the disability rights organizations. For those of you who may not be aware, Vermont Right to Life's purpose and mission since 1974 has always included legal protection for the unborn, the newly born at risk for infanticide, especially the disabled newborn, and the terminally ill and elderly at risk of assisted suicide and euthanasia. As a participant in the extensive debate over legalized assisted suicide that dates back at least a dozen years before being ultimately passed into law in 2013, I am familiar with the history. Uh, proponents of Act 39 repeatedly assured this legislative body, the House and this committee, that legal safeguards were warranted and important. Yet today, the same proponents of the safeguards are requesting that this committee strip most of them away. No. Our concerns about S-74 include the following. Is this year the right timing for isolated, depressed, elderly, sick and lonely Vermonters to have fewer safeguards? Is a phone conversation with a physician enough to ascertain whether reduced financial and personal circumstances are impacting the decision to hasten the end of life or to discover if family members are pressuring that request. Is shortening the time period required to think things over, especially during COVID, in the best interest of the patient making a request under Act 39? Patients are increasingly unable to access healthcare services without delays for care. Does that pressure people into decisions that might not otherwise be made? Turning assisted suicide into an act of desperation rather than desire. I have sent your committee assistant, Aaron, the Case Cheney account for the committee. Uh, it's a short account of a case in Oregon. The documented story of Kate Cheney in Oregon where assisted suicide has been legal since 1997 is a case in point. According to several sources, Kate's daughter went doctor shopping for a physician who would fill a prescription. Kate's own daughter declined to write the requested prescription out of his concern for her mental competence due to dementia. He then referred Kate to a psychiatrist as required by that law at that time. Kate was accompanied to that appointment by her daughter. The psychiatrist wrote in his report that she, Kate, the mother, did not seem to be explicitly pushing for this and declined to author authorize the lethal prescription. Eventually a physician was found to write the prescription and Kate Cheney swallowed the lethal dose. Later, Kate's daughter told the reporter that she found the safeguards to be a roadblock. 
While VRLC vigorously opposes the underlying concept behind Act 39, the overriding concern for us is that Vermonters may not be making that serious decision free from coercion. As S74 states in section C at the second page, no person shall be subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action for acting in good faith compliance with the provisions of this chapter. Should S74 be enacted into law, will family members who pressure an elderly or ill person to die before their time and under duress be immune from liability? Also, there is the most public Vermont case to date of Maggie Lake. She was the third person to enter life under the new law, Act 39, back in 2015. Importantly, her sister Katie Lesser told Seven Days in 2015 that her sister's experience led her to believe the requirements are appropriate. She, this is the direct quote. The longer she, and she's referring to Maggie, went through the, that process, the more doctors, the more meetings, she became more rooted in knowing what she, that she might want to do this, Lesser said. The seven days coverage also noted that not only did it take Ma Maggie eight hours to die after ingesting the lethal dose, the family members became distraught and worried that the dose was wrong. In light of that account and others, I urge this committee to evaluate, evaluate the available drugs currently in use under Act 39. Dr. Diana Barnard and Dr. Jana Clow presented at the UVM Medical Center Grand Rounds on Act 39 and their own words are cause for deep concern. I have submitted the entire transcribed presentation to the committee and I ask that you review it. But as it is 16 pages long, I would like to take a moment to just highlight a few paragraphs of concern. It's important to note that the drugs originally expected to be uh, used to initiate death under Act 39 are no longer available. Instead, proponents of assisted suicide have been experimenting with various drugs and drug combinations and their attempts to find a lethal combination. The following are noteworthy comments made at the Med Medicine Ground Rounds held on Friday, February 28, 2020. Titled An Update on Act 39, Medical Aid in Dying, it was an hour long presentation by Dr. Diana Barnard and Jane Clow. And I have four short quotes to, four short paragraphs to read to you. The presenters promoted the acceptance of lethal medication for those who are not facing imminent end of their lives and who are not suffering uncontrollable physical pain. Instead, they said that the time may be right for some people when they can no longer walk to the bathroom. Dr. Barnard discussed rectal administration of the lethal dose as an alternative to oral administration in patients whose rugae have been damaged by disease and treatment and or treatment, making it, quote, very hard to absorb, though she admitted she personally had not used the method. So one question that needs to be asked is, can rectal administration be self-administered? Next, the presentation revealed the experimental nature of the new techniques being used to end a person's life. Dr. Barnard bemoaned the fact that, and this is her word, lovely drugs such as cecobarbital, secobarbital, and pentobarbital that are very, quote, quick acting, put you in a coma, cause respiratory depression and death, are no longer available in the United States due to terrible things like being used in executions. You will see that on page 14. Dr. Barnard also presented new and experimental protocols, including a four drug cocktail called DDMP2, as well as G-tube insertion of the drugs and rectal insert insertion. Dr. Clow said complications that can arise that include regurgitation or prolonged dying, also on page 14. And finally, Dr. Jana Clow on page 16 made this comment. Because we are learning how to create sort of realistic expectations on the part of patients and families, and because the drug protocols are changing, and this is still such uncertain territory, we're all trying to evolve and adapt and create appropriate expectations. But I would say that complications of, whether it's difficulty ingesting and getting the complete 
dose because of dysphagia or the body not responding to the dose the way we would anticipate because of cassexia or because they have ALS, but their heart and lungs are very strong and may not be impacted by the doses. The experience of it kind of not going as planned is really the complication that causes the greatest stress for people. In conclusion, in light of the experimental nature of the drugs being used under Act 39, BRLC does not believe that granting immunity to prescribing pharmacists is warranted, especially in light of the risks of prolonged dying and regurgitation. Further, the potential for abuse and coercion granted by all involved immunity, by granting all involved immunity under S74, raises alarming possibilities for vulnerable Vermonters. I had the opportunity to see the testimony submitted earlier by Dr. Margaret Daly to this committee, which can be found uh, under your uh, documents online. She works as an endocrinologist at the Rutland Regional Hospital. And I was gratified to see that her conclusion reflects mine. Uh, we, we agreed, uh, uh, I had already written, Vermonters do not need fewer safeguards around Act 39, but quite the opposite, we need more. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, and actually, I do not see your testimony on the web. Oh, yes. Nope. It's not no, there it's, yet. It's, I'm sorry, Senator. It's not. So okay. I have to I have to create a hotspot. Now I'm going to try to drive to <laughs> McDonald's for enough bandwidth to get to this testimony. <laughs> I, oh, I went have... on a mountain. <laughs> OK. But it's coming uh, well, very soon. All right. Not a problem. As long as we have it, uh, we'll be going through S74 again on Tuesday. So, but, you know, if we could have it before the weekend, that would be very helpful. I, I will. I will make sure that happens. All right. Thank you very much. And um, uh, questions from the committee for Mary. OK. Um, I, I think. Um, at this point, I know David Englander is here and he does have uh, uh, some comments to make. Uh, David, do you want to do that today or can we or should we wait until Tuesday? I'm thinking about our time crunch this morning. Why don't we if you're going to take it up on Tuesday? I'm happy to come back on Tuesday. OK, um, and I'll uh, Aaron, you'll have to assure me that we'll have sufficient time for this on Tuesday. But uh, maybe could you give us a thumbnail of your comments? You, uh, David, sorry. Hey, oh. <laughs> um, so I, I haven't had a chance to, to, to review the testimony provided, but I, but I do want, I just want to briefly say that the Department of Health has not received any complaints of, of potential abuse, coercion, or, or undue influence um, throughout the, the eight years we've been we've been doing this. So th these these are you know these are valid concerns raised by by those in various communities, but that hasn't been Vermont's experience. Okay, thank you. Um, why don't we? Uh, do you have other um, specific comments that you would like to make on Tuesday? I, I would have to review that the, the, the testimony submitted, but right. not at the time. All right. Well, let's do that. And then, uh, because we will come back to this and um, greatly appreciate your being here and taking time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, both of you. Terrific. Okay. Um, so we'll, uh, committee, we will come back to this issue and we'll have time for review of the bill and then uh, discussion on Tuesday and hopefully without having a protracted floor session, we'll get to do some of our work. We're gonna start getting under the crunch as bills come up, but we should be good. All right, um, I, before Katie um, introduces the draft that we asked her to put together, I would like to share with you some of the work that I've been doing behind the scenes on the mask requirement bill uh, and share with you some information. I did spend um, a, a long time talking with uh, colleagues about this across the country, but one of those persons is Emily Summers of uh, University of Michigan. 
in her bio is at the end of the two, page, two couple pages that are under my name. It'll go under her name. Uh, ultimately, I just for ease today, it's under my name. So, you know, it's there. That's all. Um, so you can read her background and bio and have some comfort in her ability to understand and present the information that is on the couple of pages that she sent to me um, after we've had uh, conversations. Um, so, you know, I think what was most encouraging was her, um, and for all of the epidemiologists and infectious disease folks that I did speak with, um, encouragement about going forward and understanding the issues around masking in our state. Uh, I did ask some very specific questions, and I know that you'll have questions as well as we go through the bill with Katie. A number of the questions that you might have will be answered by the information that she has provided to us. And then some of the information is kind of neat because it uh, in, in every case, she tries to communicate with uh, lay people and also with kids because she has children of her own. And um, she's, she's quite young. Uh, I think you, if you go out onto you, Michigan, you can see uh, who she is. Um, the, the first um, link that's there, uh, let's see, which link is it? Well, I'm going to pull it up and show it to you at some point. Oh, yeah, it's uh, it's the link, the Swiss cheese model that's at the top of the page. I think you'll find interesting. Uh, if you click on it, it'll isolate. After you click on the Twitter page, you can click on the Swiss cheese and you'll see the um, how important it is to have not just one, but multiple protections in place. But she was very enthusiastic about masking because it's so critical to protect the people around us. And then she also has uh, provided information about type of mask and knowing that a surgical mask needs to fit. You can't wear a mask that's drooping all over. And that some of the things that we might um, be asking about. So I'm, I'm not gonna talk forever about what is here, but I do encourage you to go out and look at this. And as we go through, I'll try to, uh, remember the things that are here and that uh, will help us as we go through the bill. We did not talk about uh, significantly about enforcement, but she did say that was an issue that um, would probably need discussion and that, that that's not her area of expertise by any means, but uh, certainly something that um, she's thought about. Um, so, and, and I, so that's it. And then the one that I, the other one I like is a little infograph under, uh, infographic under masks and it's for kids and it shows kids the, well, it can show adults too, the importance of masking. You can click on that and see it. Um, and the one comment that I may I have made in the education committee and uh, in other areas is it's how it's what we do outside of school for children, adults, and children um, that protects kids when they're in school. So masking outside of school, going different places, will um, decrease transmission. Anyway. Um, that's that. So I will leave that for your reading and enjoyment. And Katie is here. Katie, thank you for the work that you did so quickly in bringing us a bill. Um, I think you know, I think the best thing for us to do right now is to go through the bill that you have. <clears throat> I think the, the more difficult part of the bill is, is going to be enforcement, and you've highlighted that for us. But 
let's just go through the whole thing and, and, and committee. What I'm gonna suggest is because it's a committee bill and we, have, we do have information um, that will um, help us make decisions along the way. Katie, maybe you can point us to some decision-making points and then we can, we can go ahead and make those decisions if we're comfortable. So good morning, okay. Katie McGlynn, Office of Legislative Council. I will pull up the document. Are we seeing the document? Are we? Yep. 22? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so this version of this document was pulled um, in part from a bill that was introduced on the House side. And as you might imagine from the time the drafting request originally came in to now, there have been some changes um, just in the public health requirements that we're seeing, particularly around the types of masks used. So I will try to flag for you different places as I walk through the bill where the committee might wanna make, um, just give additional consideration or different decision points um, that the committee might wanna focus on. So, um, the first subsection of this bill, subsection A of the masking requirement, lays out the general requirement that individuals are masked. Subsection B, which we'll look at following A, um, lists different exceptions to the general requirement in subsection A. And then, as you might imagine, a lot of this bill turns on the definitions of different terms. So there's a whole definition section that we'll look at. Um, so just to start, um, one of the pieces to flag is this language, mass or facial coverings, uh, cloth facial coverings. So I might hold off on um, flagging that for discussion until we get to the definition piece, but that is um, a conversation that the committee may choose to have. So this first subdivision uh, reads that masks or cloth facial coverings shall be worn by all individuals five years of age or older regardless of vaccination status, who are present in a public indoor space where there are members of more than one household present. So another um, decision point that the committee may wish to consider is the age of, of five. There's sort of a mix in um, the states that have enacted a, a statewide masking requirement. Um, some states have the two years of age um, cutoff. Um, some states have, I think I've seen up to nine years of age, um, at least one or two states fall around five. So this, this um, draft has five. That doesn't mean it can't be changed, but it's just something that the committee might want to have further discussion on. And then let's go, and let's go through the, the whole bill. And unless there's uh, an instant uh, reply on this, let's, let's uh, do our decisions afterwards. Okay, right. so the next subdivision, subdivision two, um, gives a recommendation. Since subdivision uh, A1 has the mask requirement applying to individuals five years of age or older, this subdivision two says that children who are between the ages of two and four are strongly recommended to wear a mask or cloth facial covering uh, under close adult supervision when present in a public indoor space where there are members of more than one household present. And then there's a caveat to that um, in subdivision B, that children in a childcare facility are not to wear a mask or cloth facial covering while napping. And I think that's probably self-explanatory. So next subsection B, we get into the exceptions to the requirement that was just laid out. Um, and there are a series of them. And so this language says notwithstanding A, an individual, or in the case of a minor, the individual's parent or guardian may choose not to have the mask or cloth facial covering worn under the following circumstances. So I'll walk you through each of these. First, the individual has a physical or mental condition or disability that prevents the individual from wearing a mask or cloth facial covering, including individuals with a medical condition for whom wearing a mask or cloth facial covering could obstruct breathing or who are unconscious, incapacitated, or otherwise unable to remove a mask or cloth facial covering without assistance. 
Second, the individual is receiving routine or preventative medical treatment that requires the healthcare provider to access the portion of the individual's face that is otherwise covered by the mask or cloth facial covering. And what comes to mind here is the oral surgeon needing to access somebody's mouth to perform the procedure. Uh, subdivision three, uh, the individual is hearing impaired or communicating, with the, uh, or communicating with an individual who is hearing impaired where the ability to see the mouth is essential for communication and a transparent mask is either not available or its use is not practicable. In subdivision four, uh, the exception applies for a limited time to enable the individual to participate in a religious activity that would otherwise be restricted by the use of a mask or cloth facial covering. In subdivision five, the exception would apply for a limited time while the individual is eating or drinking or for identification purposes in compliance with safety and security requirements. Uh, subdivision six, when the individual is wearing a respirator. In subdivision seven, where an employee has determined that an employee's use of a mask or cloth facial covering is infeasible or creates a greater hazard, such as when it's important to see the employee's mouth for reasons related to job duties or when the work requ uh, requires the use of the employee's uncovered mouth or when the use of a mask or cloth facial covering presents a risk of serious injury or death to the employee. So those are the exceptions. And then we move into subsection C. And as I said, so much of this bill is made up by the definitions of these terms that we're using. So in subdivision one, we have the definition of a mask or cloth facial covering. Uh, when this language was initially drafted, uh, we weren't receiving the recommendations to move to the medical grade masks. So this, um, underlying language, mask or cloth facial covering means uh, a medical or non-medical face covering worn over an individual's nose or mouth that complies with the recommendations of the CDC. Um, but last night I pulled out some of the language that was approved yesterday for the State House with regard to the, um, the uh, po mask policy in effect in the State House. Um, and just highlighted that to give you some additional language to consider. Um, so the can, that, just, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's great, Katie. I'll just make a comment here that one of the things that Dr. Summers indicated was that the those masks that have the ventilators in them are, really don't work. They're inappropriate because they allow for the uh, breath to go out through the ventilators. So a lot of pe some people have been using those. Anyway, thank you for putting that in. Okay. So the three types of um, masks. Um, that were in the state house mask policy were medical uh, procedure or surgical type mask made of multiple layers of non-woven polypropylene material, the N95, KN95 or KF94 or similar grade mask, and also language a more protective grade mask. So I'll just- I have a, I have a question. I'm gonna interrupt again, sorry. <laughs> One of the things we've heard is that having a surgical grade mask then with a cloth mask over it is also appropriate. And maybe we should uh, add that clarity. You know, just because people will wonder, well, if I have this cloth mask on, nobody can see my surgical mask, is that a problem? I, I don't know, committee can decide yes or no on that one. We can incorporate that in if the committee chooses to move in that direction. Um, and then there's this last sentence um, in this definition. In the case of individuals with a medical condition complicated or irritated by a mask or cloth facial covering, a translucent shield or sneeze guard is acceptable in lieu of the mask or other cloth facial covering. So again, all points for consideration. Now, in terms of public indoor space, um, where this uh, requirement would apply, under this draft, it means an enclosed indoor area that is publicly or privately owned, managed, operated to which individuals have access by right or by invitation, express or implied, and that is accessible to the public, serves as a place of employment, or is an entity providing services. 
A public indoor space includes public transportation conveyances, such as buses, trains, and ride services, and one in a mass transportation station or terminal, including airports. A public indoor space does not mean an individual's residence, including a room in a motel or hotel, a residence provided through um, a public or independent school or public or private post-secondary educational institution that operates in the state, uh, so a dorm. Um, and it doesn't uh, mean a single or double occupancy cell at a correctional facility. And it also doesn't include a temporary structure. This temporary structure is a defined term. So I might just jump down and, and cover what that means. Well, we're talking about it. So a temporary structure means a structure that is designed to be easily transported or dismantled after its function has been fulfilled and is not permanently attached to the ground or connected to utilities such as water, sewer, electricity. So it comes to mind there is something like um, an events tent that is put up for a particular tent maybe. Um, it has flaps so you feel sort of like you're enclosed, but it's a temporary structure. Um, and that wouldn't mean meet the definition of an indoor space as defined um, in this definition. Um, next, the term respirator is defined in subdivision three, meaning a type of personal protective equipment that is certified um, by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health or is authorized under the emergency use authorization by the US, uh, the FDA. Common types of respirators include filtering face piece respirators, elas elastometric meric respirators, and powered air purifying respirators. Um, and then lastly, on page five, line three, we have the definition of vaccination status. Um, in the subsection A in the requirement portion of the bill, we say that this requirement applies regardless of somebody's vaccination status. And by that term, we mean the individual's history as it relates to having or not having received the vaccination for COVID-19. Um, I was asked in subsection D to add language of what um, a penalty provision might look like. That's something that's not in the House version of the bill. So I've added that here in subsection D. Um, and this reads that an individual, or in the case of a minor, the parent or guardian, um, of an individual who violates this section may be assessed a civil penalty not to exceed $250 a day for each day in which the individual is in violation. And the Judicial Bureau shall have jurisdiction over violations of this subsection relating to refusal to wear a mask or cloth facial covering. And so this would be sort of, um, since this is organized under the Judicial Bureau, this would sort of look like um, receiving a ticket, like if you were stopped for speeding or having um, a headlight out, um, receiving a, a ticket and having to pay the fine. So it would be very similar to that. Um, and then in subsection E, um, the question is, how long is this requirement in effect? And instead of linking it to a date certain, um, the version that the House introduced um, linked it to how the CDC ranks community tr transmission in a particular county. Um, and then, as you'll see highlighted below, um, your conversation, I can't remember if it was yesterday or two days ago, generated some other ideas of sort of triggers for ending the requirement. So we can cover those as well. Um, but beginning on line 10, Compliance with this section shall be required in each county in indicated to have high or substantial community transmission by the CDC until the county's community transmission level is below substantial for two continuous weeks. On a daily basis, the health department is to post on its website the masking requirements for each county based on applying the CDC um, guidelines to Vermont data. Well, um, I was preparing to come to meet with you this morning. I took a look, no, uh, Nevada is doing something very similar to this and they have a chart that they're, I don't know if it's their health department or, um, but their, their government is posting a chart every day that shows 
um, when a certain county has um, met the required threshold and can kind of come off the, the masking requirement list. So if that committee is interested, I could share what um, Nevada's kind of chart looks like so you could get a sense for what how that might be implemented. Again, I, there... I just, I, I'll just insert here that Dr. Summers is responsible for doing the same thing in Michigan and has uh, county and town dashboard information um, similarly. So, but the, Nevada, I think is, has been a bit ahead on masking. It'd be good to see what they do. And, and another question I have for the committee, which is a decision point for me, is whether or not in the state of Vermont, it's county or state. So just a question. So other alternative um, ways to, to look at this kind of trigger for when the mandate wouldn't, um, the requirement wouldn't uh, apply anymore is the days above 100% capacity in the ICUs, uh, perhaps death rates, hospitalization, util hospital utilization rates, days that the ICU is closed, and then to try to get to Senator Lyon's point of having more of a, a broader look at the state as a whole instead of county by county, um, when 12 of 14 counties are below the substantial level for community transmission um, because the CDC data is, is broken down by county. Um, so, and you know, having maybe some percentage or a majority of the counties um, coming within a certain level would maybe be the trigger for the requirement to end. So certainly a point for further discussion, but those are some ideas to get the committee thinking. And then the um, because of the the time frame, um, this act would take effect on passage versus July 1, 2022, of course. Okay. Um, why don't why don't we do this? Um, questions for Katie, clarification questions initially. Senator Hooker. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Katie, for doing this. Did I miss or is there not anything in the bill that uh, looks at what kind of verification somebody would have to have for the exemptions? The, this doesn't have any built-in verifications. For example, you wouldn't need a, a doctor's note to say I have a condition that, you know, doesn't require me to have a mask. That's something the committee could talk about, but it's not um, considered in this draft. Okay, thank you. Senator Cummings. Uh, and Senator, we would love to hear your voice. So good. Um, <laughs> you mentioned a exemption for a religious uh, taking part in a religious service. Some religions have communion, which is very qu quick. You can drop the mask, put it back on. Uh, but there's also some extensive preaching. Some religions, there's extensive singing. How broad is that? If the entire congregation is singing, are they are they required to wear a mask? Is the choir required to wear a mask? Because um, that we're that's one hot button. I think will get us some reaction. Sure. So the the language itself um, is a bit narrow in that it's only for a limited time. Um, that the ex exception applies to enable the individual to participate in a religious activity that would otherwise be restricted by the use of a mask or cloth facial covering. So if it's an activity you could do with the mask on, um, like singing or like speaking, I, this language suggests that the mask would have to stay on. If it's something where, um, you know, to, to uh, accept communion, you'd have to take the mask down. If you have to kiss the Torah, you'd have to take the mask down. Um, but to to sing or to speak, um, 
this language suggests that the mask would have to stay on because the activity can be done with a mask on. Uh, Senator Taranzini. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Uh, I have uh, quite a few comments or thoughts and concerns around the bill. Uh, so I don't know if you wanted me to address those now, uh, Senator Lyons, or you want me to hold off? Well, uh, you know, if they're going to be about the bill as we go through it, we're going to walk through it uh, and then look at the decision points. And so it may be that you have comments at that time. Yeah, I, and I will I will say with all due respect, I, I think this is probably going to be a four person bill, not a committee bill, because I I don't think I'll be voting for it. So that's OK. OK, I mean, it can still be a committee bill with a with a vote uh, that is not unanimous. OK, all right. As yeah. long as, all right. And I'll hold my thoughts for now. I just have a, a half page of notes here I took. So, OK, good. That's good. Uh, so as we go through the bill, we can hear each person's thoughts. I think that's important. Um, yeah, Katie, I do have a question and uh, I beat you to it, Ruth. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, the, the question is, is so should we be silent if we were silent uh, on enforcement? What are the consequences of that? Um, you would be free not to have an enforcement mechanism. Um, in practice, um, there, there wouldn't be this sort of ticketing system. Um, I suppose if um, you, you chose um, not to wear a mask um, and it could be proven that because you did not wear a mask that somebody else um, maybe got sick and suffered some type of um, serious damage there could be um, you know, an action based on that, there would, um, you'd have yeah. to be able, it, you'd, have, it does get you'd have to be able to prove that. Yeah, it um, does get complicated. Okay, thank you. I, I think that that helps. Senator Hardy. Um, I can wait for Senator Terenzini if, if he had a question specific to this. I'll just be quick. I thank you, Senator Hardy. I, I would just say to that point, what Katie just said, I mean, you know, the schools, for example, have stopped contact tracing because uh, the virus is so, so widespread with community spread. I don't, how would you ever prove that uh, I gave it to someone in the community who had to be put on a ventilator because of me being reckless, for example. So I, I think that's, that is going down a really dangerous mm. slope of you know, he said, she said, I got it from this person, that person, you could get it from, well, I'll give you an example. I, we don't ever leave this house without a mask on. We're all fully vaxxed. My kids are eligible. And three of my five, three of my kids have COVID right now, and they don't leave the house without a mask. So I, I think it's just so widespread that we could never say, geez, I gave it to my neighbor and they died. And now I'm going to get sued or be held legally liable because I passed it on. I think that's really a dangerous precedent. Okay. Yep. Thanks. And that that'll that'll be part of the um, enforcement discussion. I just want I wanted to ask that question up front, so we had a kind of a picture of the complexity that might arise. Senator Hardy. Thank you, um, Senator Lyons. Um, so, Katie, on the when we, when we did have the statewide mask mandate under the um, state of emergency when there was a state of emergency. Did we have, was that, what were the enforcement mechanisms at that time? Is it, was it different because it's a state of emergency, I assume, but. Um, I would have to go back and look at the executive order to see what was built in. I, I don't think I have an answer for you. Um, I, I'd wanna, I'd wanna do a little more research before I oh, give you okay. an answer. Yeah, but that's a good question, uh, and, uh, and the issue, uh, what, from what I understand, there were two major enforcement uh, enforcements in, that took place. One was in Rutland, and I think the other one was, it could have been in my district, but it was the um, exercise workout um, fitness place that yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I think there was one in Newport. I, I had a yeah. couple more Newport? questions. If, okay. Um, I, I mean, I, I agree with Senator Terenzini that sort of like trying to track how anyone gets it these days is is really, really difficult. And um, I, I wouldn't want to have the ability for someone to bring suit off uh, out of, you know, something that happened at the grocery store. Uh, but I, I think that enforce, I'm not as concerned about enforcement. I'm more concerned about saying we have a statewide mass, ma mass mandate during this particular requirement. or requirement during this particularly troubling time and that um, it be as simple and clear as possible without all the like bells and whistles, but just saying <laughs> that um, and I, I just to some of the question points that Katie had throughout the bill, um, if we're at the point to go through them, I, I have some thoughts on some of them. Um, okay, hold on to those. Uh, we're going to go through the bill as soon as we've had our questions of clarification and kind of concerns. Okay. Good. Uh, Senator Cummings. Okay. The base argument when this came up in the fall was will it do any will it change anything the two that were businesses that did not you know point blank refuse to have a mass mandate refused to require their employees to be masked and refused they and they got hauled in but for the average person on the street who goes in to a store at this point in time when anyone who is hasn't gotten their head stuck in the sand or hasn't been on Mars for the last year knows that you should wear a mask, that it protects you, it protects your neighbors. Um, and there is debate according to my emails and I get a lot of them about whether or not masks actually work but will having a mandate cause people who don't wear masks now to wear them or will it just set up conflict points and it's a you know it's it's a balancing the the positives versus the negatives and the negatives are the risks we're putting people at who will have to say you need to leave my store because you're not wearing a mask um so i think and i, I think mean, that that you know why 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 do we think this will do something more um, <laughs> it, you so Senator, that's a longer conversation, yeah. but we have heard from, I have in particular heard from retail establishments that they would like to see a statewide mask requirement, yeah. which would help them with their mask requirements in their stores. Um, and then also remember that all the information you hear about, well, we had a mask on and yet we still got COVID or so, and I had a, we all had masks on and COVID was still transmitted. Remember that the mask itself uh, limits the uh, size of the viral um, exchange so that the more virus you get exposed to, the greater your illness in many cases. So what happens when you put a mask on is you limit that virus that's going out into the world. And some of the masks do that exceedingly well. So nothing goes out then the, the more virus you have, the greater virulence and the greater the, possibly the greater the case, depending on all the other things that have to do with you and your health. So masks do help, period. I mean, there's no question about it. And then sure, the I other thing know, that, we haven't, that we did talk about, we heard testimony on, we can go back and look at it if you'd like, but is the you know, 3% of the people in our, in our population are immunocompromised and they're the ones who need the greatest protection. All those protected categories benefit when we have a mask requirement, especially going into stores. So, um, you know, we'll 
we can continue to look at that data as we need to, but I think the time now is to go through the bill with Katie and look at um, the questions, the decision points, how we're gonna uh, finalize this proposal. And then we'll have the Department of Health in to comment, whether they can comment directly on the bill at this point, I don't know, but they certainly can offer their comments on masks as we've asked them. So Katie, I'm turning it back to you. We probably should put it back up on the screen. And then as we go through, let's try to make some decisions. I know we wanna have a lot of conversation, but let's see if you can come to a decision on uh, these things. Okay. Um, so the uh, I, got it. I have another suggestion. You're probably going to say it too, but should we start with the definition of mask? Sure. Because I think then that influences the rest of it. Um, so we have language that includes um, a cloth facial covering in addition to kind of a medical grade covering. Um, that definition specifies that it would be worn over the person's nose and mouth. Um, we also have language from the, the state house uh, masking policy. And there is also a proposal to have, um, to allow the cloth facial covering if it's used in conjunction with more of the medical grade covering. So there are a couple different options that the committee could um, discuss. Committee, anybody want to make a definitive statement on this? Go ahead, Ruth. Okay, it, it seems to me that based on the testimony that we got about um, masks and their efficacy on Wednesday and the different types of masks, um, I think that um, we should, um, <laughs> And I don't know how to do this, Katie. So I'm just going to say what I, I'm thinking, and and you can see if you can figure out how to draft it. But um, that I wouldn't want to say that cloth facial coverings are not acceptable because that may be what somebody only only has a cloth face facial covering because so many of us have them from the early days, and um, that we clearly heard that that is better than nothing. But I would want to have language that says that we prioritize the 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 language from the state house mask mandate those masks the kn95s etc are what we what is the best option um and that a cloth mask is acceptable if nothing else is available kind of thing i wouldn't um, say that I, I have to disagree with that. I'm sorry. Um, the well, I wasn't the... finished, Jenny. <laughs> okay, could, but... go ahead. <laughs> um, the, um, and the sneeze guard, I, I'm a little concerned about that. We, you already have a, 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 a exception for people who are not able to wear masks. And those sneeze guards are, I think, have been proven to be not, not, um, effective. So I wouldn't even want to say that those are okay. Um, but that we, you know, would like the surgical and KN95 masks and that uh, that complies with CDC, the cloth masks are acceptable if the others are not available. So I, I you know, I think the question is the cloth mask. And one of the things we know is it's the fit of the mask that's so critical. So if you're going to say cloth mask, um, <laughs> if you're going to say cloth mask, yeah, there it is. I mean, you, a knitted mask does not work. It is extremely porous and allows for uh, high transmission. The goal here is to limit viral transmission. So you want something that is effective in doing that. Um, so, um, 
I I think that the the language that we got from in the state house that we that we're going to be responsible for in the state house is a is a good is a good language, and then adding in the surgical type mask with the cloth mask, these masks are going to be available and they are available. So I'm, you know, I just uh, I I think that limiting the viral transmission is absolutely key in this. So, Chair, uh, Senator Hooker. Thank you. Um, I guess I have a question about the availability of the masks. Certainly in the state house, they're going to be available, but does this uh, suppose that every public space has masks available for people who don't have the surgical masks? So, and how do we... I mean, I most of the places that I've gone into, including retail establishments, have a little stand with um, surgical masks. Um, but we can, uh, if 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 the committee wants to include uh, cloth facial coverings, then I think we should qualify it and say closely fitting cloth fa cloth facial coverings. When you put a bandana on, that's not good. And I've seen some folks with bandanas wrapped around and that doesn't work. They're, they're leaky all over the place. So Senator Cummings. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> you're muted, Senator. Ann, you're muted. You're muted, Ann. <laughs> I'm hanging around with Senator Sorotkin too often. Um, I'm concerned about my ski mask. Uh, there's all kinds of ski masks that cover your nose and your mouth, but that's very porous, but there are some that aren't. I still like my three layer with silk mesh in between uh, cloth masks. And perhaps we could say a cloth mask that is at least two to three layers thick no single layer cloth mask, which means no cowboy bandanas, um, which is the thing I see most often, or sometimes they're just the. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, I got a turtle fur thing that pulls up over my nose. I no. don't think that works. It does the word secure help. You know, a mask that fits securely. Actually, right. surgical masks they are don't. a terrible fit. They're square. <laughs> and then you get to, I don't know if the KN95s I bought are really KN95s or okay, they're we can't go there. We can't or what they are. I, I don't know. Yeah, I know. It's hard. You got to read the fine print. I did want to flag that there is language in the state house policy. I'm not sure if I'll be able to switch documents, um, but it did have some language around like a mask having loops um, and that would kind of um, eliminate the bandana type yeah. situation. Mask. I, I don't know if it did, did the document switch for you. Yes. So there's this language. So this yeah. we're looking at the state house policy right now. And there was this language um, and, oh, and four too. Um, I won't let me highlight it. Oh, there so it is. Yeah. secured with head ties or ear loops, elastic bands that go behind the individual's head, fit snugly over nose, mouth, and chin with no large gaps at the sides of the face. Um, if you like this language, I could incorporate um, that in, or if you, I mean, it's up to you, but it seems like the concern is um, using something for a mask that, you know, it wasn't originally intended to serve that purpose. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, Josh, like I'm Senator, Senator Tarantini. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, Senator Lynn. Yep. <clears throat> I don't want to get ahead of myself here a little bit because I know we're going to talk about enforcement, but uh, this, this conversation around what masks are acceptable and which masks aren't once again, who is going to enforce this in the state if this passes? Because uh, I could see tremendous conflict coming from this. If we ask law enforcement officers throughout the state to go out and enforce, enforce this, number one, we, we are short. We know we are short hundreds of 
uh, law enforcement officers as it is right now. And number two, they're not going to go in and approach someone in a store and say, sir, can I, can I inspect what type of mask you're wearing? It's just not realistic and it's not going to happen. So regardless of what we decide, this three ply or that cloth doesn't work or this or that, I, I just don't, I think we're, we're going down a rabbit hole here that's not going to be enforced. I know law enforcement officers in, in, in our community. My town has a mask ordinance right now and they're not enforcing uh, it. There are big box retailers in my town that I go into and 50% of the people aren't wearing masks and no one's saying anything about it. So I'm not trying to be negative because as I said earlier, I don't go anywhere without a mask. People in Rutland County haven't seen my face in two years because I wear a mask everywhere I go and I'm fully boosted and vaxxed and, and I think it's foolish uh, not to wear a face covering. But at the end of the day, I mean, we're like, you know, I think we're just getting down a rabbit hole here that we're just so, really- So, so our- Senator Terenzini, I know you're, you're very excited about talking about enforcement. Uh, let's, let's finish the mask, the type of mask that we would want to see in place. And then I hear you about uh, enforcement and we'll make sure that we have a t- time to talk about that. Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, although um, Senator Terenzini and I um, will ultimately vote differently on this bill, I, I agree that um, we need to keep this as simple as possible. <laughs> and that that going down the rabbit hole of what kind of mask and whether it has ear loops and how many layers it has, is not, we need to keep it simple and practical. The state house policy is a specific policy that covers specific people in a specific instance where we know masks are va- available, where we all know each other, um, where it's a small place and it's much more enforceable. Um, out in the you know, big box store or the grocery store or wherever, it's less enforceable. So I think we should say, like I said before, the, med- the medical masks, the KN95s are what is preferable and what we hope everyone will wear cloth masks are acceptable if surgical and KN95 masks are not available. And can we add, that, can you add snugly fit? Snugly fit, masks? fine, fine. <laughs> add, a, add a descriptor like that, but please keep it simple so that people are not, you know, being jerky to each other and are wearing whatever mask they can because no mask, any mask is better than no mask. And exactly. So wanna Good. say, this is the best mask, if you have it, please wear it. But if all you have is that cloth mask that your neighbor made for you in March of 2020, wear that because it's better than no mask at all. So keeping it simple, straightforward, easy to comply with, and uh, I think is the best um, thing we could do at this point. Okay. All right. You've, you've argued it well, Senator, uh, but as long as we can say snugly fit, uh, because you're right, no uh, one any kind of mask is better than no mask in preventing transmission. But we want to educate through this that surgical masks and uh, KN95 masks are preferred. Preferred, oh. absolutely. I, I'm fine okay. with saying that. I just don't want to go down as as Senator Terenzini said the rabbit hole of of oh darn. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh katie let's let's bring it back up to masks but and i'm i the question is snugly fit uh we won't uh, senator cummings had mentioned two layers we will restrain ourselves this is a hard one for me but we'll do it so you do want the inclusion of at least two layers or no do we want to say two layers or no? Hello. I think we can say recommend it, you know, snugly fit, two layered, looped mask is preferred, but you know. <laughs> okay, let's do that. That's fine. You can say I think snugly say fit, it, but, I regardless, yeah. regardless of what the cloth mask is, it needs to be snugly fit. We need to eliminate those bandanas that I see the guys in the hardware store wearing. Sorry. Anyway, 
it's not just the hardware store, it's uh, other places. I just want it to be as, sim as clear and simple as possible. So there's yeah, not well, some, you know, we, we want to make sure it's clear, simple, concise, and it's effective. You don't want to give people the wrong impression. So well, also, I, I there's not a, as much availability out there as 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 you think. It's it's hard to get ma some types of masks still. Um, I've done a lot of research on that, but we'll see what happens when we hear from the um, Department of Health. Okay. So, Katie, where are we? At the beginning. They brought us back up to the top of the bill to make a decision on the age that the requirement applies to. Uh, let's leave it at five, unless people have um, concerns well, about that age, and we'll hear from others on that. Madam Chair, I I guess I would prefer to use two. Um, when we had um, guidance back in the day, when we actually had clear guidance for schools, um, it was two and up. And especially because uh, under five-year-olds are not able to be vaccinated yet, in many ways, they're the most uh, vulnerable for transmission purposes at this point. So I would say, I would prefer saying two and up, um, but uh, knowing that, cool. Nobody's going to go and ask how old your kid is in the grocery store. Hopefully not. Um, but uh, that's my preference. Um, I'm going to go with five, but I'll listen to others. Anybody else? So I would I would look at something younger because kids are in, you know, they're in school, they're in daycare. Um, and at a, a much younger age. And frankly, I've seen more kids with masks than adults at times. Oh, they love them. I know. They, they do a good job. And I know it's difficult to find masks that fit for kids, but I think that, I make them. You know, making it, yeah, you make them. Um, so are you go, you want to go down to the age of two is what I'm hearing then? I would say, I would say two and up or maybe three and up, two and up, I think, because kids are at school, you know, they're at daycares. Yeah, and they can wear them. I've seen that. I've been to child care centers. Oh, I know, they love them. So two and up, I think, makes more um, sense. Under two is difficult to get them to keep them on, but. All right, let's go with two. Mm -hmm. okay. Katie? Got it. All right. I will make that change. And then you've got this uh, between two and four strongly recommended. So we'll get rid of that to be consistent with the decision the committee just made. And I'll probably still leave this carve out that while children yeah. are, are napping, they're not required to wear them. Yeah. Um, or eating. Okay. So the other big, I mean, we can go through each of these sections, but the other big, big decision that the um, committee needed to make on this was the kind of trigger for when the requirement was no longer in effect. So if you'd like, I'll scroll down to the bottom of the bill. Yep. Are we going to the trigger? I'm yep, sorry. We're going, and then we yep. can come back to the penalty if you like, but yep. um, the subsection E. I'm not seeing the trigger. Where's the trigger? Oh, there it is. Subsection E. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the the highest um, substantial and highest uh, transmission, as reported by the CDC, and then the timeline for, and then the day. Okay, go go ahead. I got it. So Madam go ahead, Chair. Kate. Let Katie go through it first. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, like I mentioned, um, the version that is on the house side is the language that's not highlighted. So this is um, the CDC categorizes each county in the US um, via uh, regarding the community transmission in that county. Um, and the two highest categories are higher substantial. So the language in the house is that um, if it dips below higher substantial and that um, it re remains that category for two continuous weeks, then that county is no, the mass requirement no longer applies to that county. And then there's also language that the health department is, would be posting um, 
on its website the requirements for each county based on this data so it's accessible to folks who are curious if it's still in effect in their county but um I think it was yesterday, there were a lot of alternatives that were also discussed, and those are highlighted in yellow. So, um, let's go, this, everything is sort of together here. Uh, so, can we agree on the higher substantial um, com community transmissions by CDC as the uh, trigger that I think is what is used across the board and recommended. And then the moderate is a much lever, that's the next, that's the lower level. And I think it's like 10 people per period of time per thousand or whatever. So um, can we agree to that high and well, substantial? Madam Chair, I, I'm concerned about the county by county thing in our- Yeah, well, not there group. yet. <laughs> well, this is related. So I, I, I think um, the the substantial spread on a county basis, what, what my main concern for having a mask mandate is I'm, is the, the capacity of our hospitals and their ability to function um, and our capacity of our schools and their ability to function. Um, so the, I, I would, really strongly like to have some kind of measures that are about the hospital capacity the the transmission rate with omicron is less of a it less of a, a measure um, because it's so highly transmissible um, so i katie has in here a suggestion of 12 of 14 counties below substantial and i i think that actually Maybe. That's what we were getting to next, but you let you want to you want to put that on the table, and I would yeah, probably, I want to put that yeah. on the table because right. I, I'm concerned about a county by county. I mean, it does, right. means that everybody's going to have to look in the morning. Oh, is Rutland County or Addison County or whatever on uh, the and no, we all nobody's going to do that. I mean, there are, oh. some people are going to do it, but most people are not going to do it. So I think it needs to be a statewide thing and. If we want to do any kind of county transmission thing, I would say that you know twelve of fourteen or something like that. Okay, um, but so let's also having things in there about hospital capacity. All right, Senator, the high and substantial county is the way the CDC does it, and then our we can look at it as a twelve out of fourteen for a period of time. So the period of time becomes important. Is it twelve to fourteen days? Is it uh, seven days? Uh, some recommendations by uh, public health experts indicate seven days of below substantial. So that's another decision point. Then I know that uh, Devin Green of the VAS has weighed in on the hospital uh, issue and maybe Katie could talk about that. I'll actually have to pull up that email. So I there you I... go. <laughs> Let me stop sharing and I will um so, so you know while you're doing that i think uh the point is uh, that we're a small state and having it county by county really doesn't make sense sense especially when people from are traveling for jobs in every single county this is <laughs> so if it were 12 of 14 i think that's a that's a good suggestion and then the question is for how long is it for 14 days is it seven days senator cummings I'm not muted. If your two yeah. counties that remain high are in the Northeast Kingdom and have small populations, that's one thing. If your two counties that remain high are Chittenden Franklin, and Franklin or Chittenden and uh, Washington, you've got a substantial portion of your mm -hmm. state's population in those two counties. And I think there's studies, is it Denver that ended things early and right. the flu epidemic that I'd say it's all or nothing. So the state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that obviates all those little idiocy. If you get sick in the kingdom yeah. and you're really sick, you're going to UVM. Yeah. Or okay. Connecticut. 
that makes a lot of sense. What do we think Wait, about that? Can I that? just uh, ask? I'm sorry, Ann. Uh, no, Senator Cummings, yeah. did you just say you you think it should be statewide, not tw yes. 12 or 14? Okay. I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. I'm okay with that. I, I just yeah. I think county by county, it just gets too complicated. County by county is a, is is deadly. <laughs> and it, I mean, all of this is based on the assumption, which is false, that people have access to the health department's website. And even the work in broadband know that a substantial amount of Vermont does not have access. And that's an issue. So which, which raises a question, but I will hold my question. Now I'm gonna save it because we're not there yet. Okay, Katie. Do you want me to read Devin's email? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, we think the threshold for the mask mandate should coincide with the CDC guidelines, meaning people wear masks in areas of substantial or high transmission. It was hard to figure out a clear threshold using hospital data and ICU data, particularly due to staff shortages. Here is the CDC guidance, and ha she said she's happy to discuss further. So everyone two years or older who is not fully vaccinated should wear a mask in indoor public places. In general, you do not need to wear a mask in outdoor settings. In areas with high cases, a high number of cases, wear a mask in crowded outdoor settings and for activities with close contact with others who are not uh, fully vaccinated. People who have a condition or who uh, are taking medications that weaken their immune systems may not be fully protected, even if they are fully vaccinated. They should continue to take all precautions recommended for unvaccinated people, including well-fitted masks, until advised otherwise by a provider. And if you are fully vaccinated to maximize protection and prevent possibly spreading COVID to others, wear a mask indoors in public if you are in an area of substantial or high transmission. So she um, is pulling that from the CDC. Right. So Katie, can I just ask a clarifying question about that? So, so Devin is speaking on behalf of Vaz and she's saying the hospitals don't want to use um, hospital capacity data. They just want to use transmission data. I don't think she said they don't want to. She said it was hard to figure out a clear threshold using hospital capacity and ICU data, particularly due to staff shortages. Yeah, I, I can see uh, some problems in trying to put all that together and making a final decision. I think it, it's it's easier if you if we're trying to get some clear cut guidelines, concise guidelines. Uh, so I could empathize with what she was saying about uh, not being able to have instant data and on a daily basis. Can we put her email on the website just because, I mean, if we're going to not go with hospital data, because yeah. what I heard from, uh, from Dr. Yeah. Leahy on Wednesday was he thought using some kind of, you know, hospital capacity measurement was was potentially a good idea. But if Devin is speaking on behalf of hospitals and saying, we can't come up with that. I want that to be on the record because it seemed to me that having some measurement of hospital capacity was was helpful. But if it's too complicated, I will stand by my let's keep it simple <laughs> mantra and I'm fine with that. But I but I also just want to make sure that's what the hospitals official will also say that the um, infectious and epidemiologist and public health folks I spoke with, including Dr. Summers, also concurred that hospital data was an, a, kind of an impossibility and a, a, adds a complexity that's probably not necessary, and that utilizing CDC guidelines uh, for highest and uh, substantial is more appropriate. So. I think we all, it all sugars off, you know, going to other states, but then coming back to Vermont and, and looking at that uh, is supportive information. So I would, and Katie, you could put that uh, up with Devin's approval, put that email up. I mean, she may want to, she may want to, I see you, I see you, Senator Hardy. She may want to uh, modify that into, um, testimony. So before we put it up, uh, we need to uh, just contact her briefly. She may just say yes, but we'll see. Uh, now, Senator Hardy. Thank you. Um, I guess the, the time, the number of days you were talking about that, seven days, 10 days, whatever, because 
as we know, after two years of a horrible experience with this, the death rates and the hospital rates trail behind the, the case rates. So if we're using a measure of case rates or transmission rates, and we stop, we might stop too soon, um, uh, given that we know that deaths are gonna be a couple weeks behind or, or hospitalizations are gonna be a week behind. So that, that, may, that may be true. Um, the, um, what we're, you have to put this all into context. So the peak for um, Omicron, which is just terrible right now, the hospitals are full, they, they can't handle what's coming in, but the peak is gonna be in two to four weeks. And so the next two to six weeks, as we've talked with folks, is critical. And we've heard that from a number of people in our committee. And then we've also heard it in, in education, in the education committee. And then we've heard it from um, experts outside of our state. So the CDC data does come in pretty regularly. And the goal is masking is to mitigate the spread so that the a, we don't get mutations happening and that we don't get really sick people. There are sick people. There are children who are affected and that um, we keep people out of the healthcare system. Uh, the, the healthcare system is as much a part of this discussion uh, from a public health perspective as our individual patients. So, um, you know, we talked about flattening the curve. Right? I think we remember that. Well, right now we're talking about getting rid of the peak, uh, keeping it from happening. And, and then um, we don't know what's coming next. So we want to keep that, whatever bad thing might happen, that from happening. Uh, so, so anyway, let's go. So on the, on the, Katie, put it back up so we can see where we are with that. I think we got to statewide. We're going to, we'll, we'll hold it at highest substantial, unless we hear back from hospitals that they can give us something on the dot and that will help with decision-making. We'll hold that thought. Because that's what we wanted to do. We originally wanted to do that, but uh. So I was writing an email during the very last part of your conversation. Um, but what I, where I think you landed and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you want language where the kind of end trigger for the requirement um, would be that the whole state, the requirement would end for the whole state once each county in the state has been under uh, the substantial level for, was it two weeks? Well, that, you know, two continuous weeks is a long time. I wonder if, uh, I don't know the answer to this. I was told that seven days may be, seven to 14 days is sufficient. So how do you say seven to 14 days? Or do you just say 14 days? What does the committee think? Senator Hardy. I think we need 14 days to my point of death rates trailing by about two weeks um, oh, okay. and, and hospitalizations trailing by about a week. So if we have 14 days, that would get us to, I guess, the, the death. death it does. I all mean, all it does, eyes. it does the, you know, it's the, it's probably the optimal. So yeah, let's leave it the way it is. Hello? Did someone have a comment? I just okay. said I've got it. Oh, it's you. <laughs> you come in very quietly in the beginning and then go ahead. Uh -oh. Yeah, I've heard that, that my audio <laughs> takes a second to pick up. Um, if you'd like to keep moving on, another piece that you um, kind of put a flag in for later is whether um, how to address a penalty, whether to have a penalty or to be silent. If you do want to include a penalty, do you want it to be this judicial bureau ticketing structure? I, you know, I think I like the ticketing structure. I'm not sure I like $250. Uh, 
I don't know what we can yeah. say. So they don't put signatures on those memos anymore. Instead. Hello? It's Dr. Levine. You should mute yourself there. He, he did. Right. Um, yeah, who, ha uh, Ruth, uh, Senator Hardy. That's okay. Um, sometimes first names are just easier. Um, the, I, I think we should just be silent on it. Um, I, I think it becomes more complicated when we have a violation and I, I, I think it become, yeah, I just think it becomes more complicated. I think we should be silent on it. I think it should be what, a, you know, a requirement that says, this is the requirement. And, you know, I, it, I, like last time we had a ma mass mandate, the vast majority of people followed it. There will be people who don't, but I think it's gonna get complicated if we have fines and penalties, et cetera. Uh, that's a recommendation, um, Senator Hooker. I'm just thinking about, you know, who's going to enforce this. And in this, it says the Judicial Bureau shall have jurisdiction. But what what does that mean and how do we define that? So the Judicial Bureau, um, they have a statute with a whole list of um, activities that they currently have jurisdiction over. But this would be sort of like a, a ticketing system. So um, I'm picturing it as um, a, like a law enforcement officer would give you a ticket if your headlight is out. I think it would be a, a similar process. And I'm still wondering, you know, at the grocery store, who's that person that's going to hand out the ticket? You know, it's is it clerk. the reader at Walmart? Is it, you know? <laughs> I'm just thinking, I don't, you know, Suppose you ran into the grocery store, you forgot your mask, and you were being held while your ice cream melted. I, uh, I just get violent. Uh, okay, Senator Cummings, and then Senator Terenzini. Okay, I'm conflicted. I think everyone should wear a mask. Um, I think we would have some ability to give store owners a mask, you know, the ability to say, you know, the state requires you wear a mask in, inside. Um, we would also expose them to some possible violence given the tenor of the present world um, without a penalty. Somebody can just flip you the bird and say, so what are you going to do about it? But with a penalty, only the police can give you a ticket. And I think we know most towns in the state don't have a police force. And the ones that do have been very clear that this is not, you know, they're struggling to keep up with the drug overdoses and everything else. So that doesn't work. And I'm also concerned you used, you know, you could tie a bandana and get away with it. Didn't do much, but we are now requiring that people purchase masks. You can't whip your own up on your sewing machine. We, we, we put that back in. We you put can that do a cloth in. mask. We did a cloth okay. mask. Okay. Right? Uh, Ruth, we are Ruth's, requiring Ruth's cloth people... masks are now on sale. Okay. Well, or I'll get my sewing machine back out. But okay, because that does away with my concern that we are forcing people to purchase masks. It's one thing to say it in the state house, and we're providing them. But to ask downtown merchants who are struggling to provide masks is not reasonable. And to ask people who are having trouble affording food. Senator, get to, to the enforcement comment. Okay. Thank you. I, I think without enforcement, it's not... It, it, it okay. just, it's just feel good. It's Okay. It's, you're you're wanting to have language that says this no enforcement I'm, i don't think it's i'm not sure it's possible to enforce i'm don't assume i'm a yes on this one i'm struggling <laughs> okay. 
with what it. is, you know, are we going to do more harm than good? Yeah. Um, and. Well, I don't, I don't know that we're, I think we're going to do more good than harm. I think the question is probably if enforcement is in at all, is it, it what is it? And Judicial Bureau is the place probably it goes. The question is, how extensive do we get into the Judicial Bureau? Do we just give it to them and say, do something? You can do something? Well, to get to Judicial Bureau, somebody has to give you a ticket. Yeah. And that is a law enforcement officer. It could be yeah. your local constable in Canaan, if you have one. Um, but there uh, here's what I'm going to suggest. I would like to hear from Senator Terenzini. Then I'd like to kind of put this one on the back burner, just the this section, because I think we've made decisions throughout the bill. Um, we'll, and so that we can move to Dr. Levine and uh, Dr. Kelso. Uh, we'll hear first of all, we'll hear Josh's uh, Senator Terenzini's comments. Then we're going to move to to our next two folks, and we'll come back to this, Senator Cummings, for a uh, uh, discussion. So, Senator Terenzini. Yeah, thanks, Senator Lyons. I, I'll just very briefly hit on a few facts that I that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I think, with respect, the entire enforcement section of this bill should be stripped out. I, I don't think that, uh, number one, you're going to see many local officers or departments enforce it. Number two, we are short hundreds of law enforcement officers across the state, as we know, um, and a lot of departments are down and out right now because they have officers that have COVID, uh, and they, they, they're struggling enough to respond to 911 calls, not, um, you know, a scuffle in a grocery store over fighting over if this person had a mask on or not. I also think that we're coming up on town meeting day, and I could see that if a, if a department uh, aggressively went around and started to find people masks, they could find their police budget being voted down from the local people who they just find for not wearing a mask. So I think there's a lot of precedent that would be set if we started going around finding people for not wearing a mask. I think education has been a, the best approach all along. I think Dr. Levine and, and Governor Scott have done a fantastic job of in, encouraging those to wear masks and get vaccinated. Uh, and I just think that especially this section should be absolutely axed out of this bill uh, and not even considered. Okay, so we'll come back to this discussion, um, Katie. Uh, for now, it's it's there, it's in, um, and uh, we'll. Um, my my concern is the fine. Two hundred and fifty bucks is a lot of money. Um, Senator Hardy, last comment or question, quick. I I. Uh... Again, uh, on this particular point, I agree with Senator Terenzini, even though I know we're going to vote differently on this bill. I think we should just get rid of this provision. I think it causes too many complications. Um, I, I, I think the uh, enforcement of the, the previous mask um, requirement was implied. Um, it doesn't need to be a very specific thing like this, and it will cause more um, problems than, than benefit. All right. Senator Hooker, do you want to make a comment before we go? Everybody I else do. has. I do, because <laughs> I'm looking at this and thinking, if there's no consequence, what is this going to provide? And I guess I go back to Senator Cummings' questions about, you know, how, and, I, and I'm way anxious to hear from the health department about how this will actually make things better for us in the state you know at the point that we are we're in in the pandemic so i'm having some difficulty you know um coming to grips with you know how i'm going to look at this and whether or not it's it's actually going to be um necessary because the outcome may not be any different from what we're seeing now okay so let us thank you all for that. This is a energetic uh, conversation throughout the day. I appreciate it. Uh, I would like now to invite our commissioner of health um, and our state epidemiologist to join us. Thank you very much for being here. 
you've gotten in on some of the conversation that we've been having a, about a proposal for a mask requirement, statewide mask requirement, and heard some of the complexities. Uh, and I'm sure you have comments to make. So Dr. Levine, please introduce yourself for the record and then I'll turn it over to you and thinking that you and Patsy Kelso may want to uh, testify together. I don't know how you have this uh, organized. You are still muted. Yes, thank you very much okay. for inviting us. Commissioner of Health, Mark Levine. I um, did have a small slide presentation, which I would like to show. Uh, okay. that deals with the topic of mitigation. Uh, can you give me a sense of our time frame? I have time beyond 11, so I'm not worried about that, uh, but in terms of the committee, so I'll know if I need to truncate some of the presentation so we have discussion time that's ample. Yeah, I mean, if you could, if you could provide your slides within a 10, 15 minute uh, yes. time frame. Okay. As long as I go through the sharing process successfully, uh, do I have sharing capability? You do. Okay. Um, Okay, we see it. We have your notes. There it is. Okay. Now are you good? Now we're good. Okay. I'm going to go very briskly in the very beginning parts because it's very old history. But what I do want to take you through is uh, mitigation as it applied to what I'm going to call the four phases of the pandemic. Um, obviously, the phase one was the beginning and a very novel virus, but there are some themes that are very relevant. Obviously, we very quickly reacted to everything on the ground. You kind of know the history. We didn't have a great playbook, but we had a pandemic flu playbook, which we tried to apply. We had, much like now, abundant community spread of virus. And um, somewhat similar to the realization we're coming to now, um, containment wasn't going to work, but for different reasons. Back then, we didn't have any testing, so we couldn't identify cases accurately. We didn't know much about asymptomatic spread, didn't know much about um, incubation periods, infectious periods, etc. So we needed to take more drastic actions, which of course came in the form of sequential application of community mitigation strategies. And you know how those played out in terms of closing various sectors of society and eventually getting to the point, um, not only of decreasing gathering size, but having people stay home and stay safe. The uh, governor was instrumental in all of this, as you're all aware. Uh, and thank goodness we have a governor who prioritizes health and safety and science and data. This was the curve that we kind of lived by. And it's interesting, we're back to that situation again, where we're looking at that dotted line, which is the capacity of the healthcare system and trying to make sure that we have enough protective measures in place so that we can not adversely have this viral um, outbreak really in, impair the ability of the healthcare system to take care of patients. So we want to be on the blue and not the red part of the curve. Um, I won't go through this slide as much because it basically just shows we learned a lot about uh, how to keep the virus suppressed, how to open in a very phased, gradual, sequential manner and gain the trust and uh, cooperation uh, of Vermonters, which was critical and has always been critical. Then we entered the next variant, the UK variant, B117, in the beginning of 2021. And that's the story of where variants began. So every time we see a variant, we want to know, is it more transmissible? It's generally going to be or it wouldn't become successful as a variant. Does it cause more severe illness? Can the variant evade the vaccine or for people who've already had a case of the disease, 
can it evade infection-induced immunity as well? And we learn a lot about uh, natural selection and evolution uh, real time. As you uh, just heard, most variant strains are gonna be more transmissible if they are capable of becoming dominant as we've seen from the UK to Delta to now Omicron. Um, we never know real time how much they impact the healthcare system and the severity of disease. We learn that as we go along, uh, but all indications are that um, that learning generally proves to be true over time. And we know that even if something is called less severe, if there are abundant more cases of it, you will still see the healthcare system be stressed because there will be more cases. Even if the rate of getting hospitalized doesn't change, the abundance of numbers will impact that system. And we've learned that other strains get outcompeted quickly. So we dealt with the UK variant very differently than we dealt with the original onset of the pandemic. And we used our data very effectively to zero in, hone in on travel and gathering size for household gatherings. We had learned and continue to learn that we didn't need to impact the business sector in as adverse a way as early on. Whether it would be retail, whether it be one-on-one -on -one contact like hairdressers or healthcare or dentistry, whether it be teleworking, uh, we knew we could get away with a lot of that and function as a society. Outdoors was always going to be better than indoors and that's been proven time after time. And restaurants, at that time, we didn't feel they were totally unsafe, but they needed to be restricted somewhat. And bars, we still felt very uncomfortable with and had closed. We had a wonderful uh, early part of summer last year, and then phase three began uh, right in July. The term is uh, objected to by many, but it truly has been the pandemic of the unvaccinated, the Delta surge, if you will. The uh, everything uh, I mentioned on the previous slides holds for Delta uh, with regard to transmissibility, et cetera. My, like every phase, we've had learning done by other countries being impact first, and in some cases, other states having more severe impacts uh, that we could learn from. We felt, I think appropriately, that being the highest fully vaccinated state we would be much more protected from Delta, Delta than we ended up being. Uh, and with the science developing, learn that it's not only important to have your full two doses of vaccine, but it's critical you have your booster dose as well. People ask constantly, why did Vermont end up with so many cases being such a highly vaccinated state? And I bucket these into three buckets. The first being the virus itself and its increased contagiousness and other aspects of it. Secondly, the population in Vermont, we had had maybe 3% of our population to be generous uh, infected in the preceding year and a half. So a very low rate of natural so-called immunity or infection mediated. And we, uh, learned very quickly that six months was too long to wait to get a booster. And so vaccine mediated immunity was waning because we were the most early and successful state, very efficiently vaccinating all of our highest risk population. And then lastly, population factors. Um, the virus is very adept and successful at identifying who's unvaccinated, the social clusters they operate within, and even rural pockets of our society where vaccination wasn't as prevalent, um, the virus finds it very effectively. Plus we have a very mobile population. By the time we got to last summer, people had started getting used to taking their mask off, to gathering together again, reliving the lives that they had lost before. So attention to mitigation was not as strong and there was some public fatigue and decreased appetite for returning to a more restrictive stance. To be clear, our vaccination strategy remained the primary mitigation strategy as it needs to be. 
in this era where we have the gift of vaccines and they are highly effective as we continue to see. Um, we learned about boosting and all of that. Terms like fully protected, up to date became more important. We still uh, continued all of the traditional strategies, masking indoors, hygiene, whether that's respiratory etiquette or washing your hands, and of course, staying home and sick. I've already mentioned recognition of where the public was at, but in addition, understanding some of those issues that make more restrictions challenging for much of the public when there's uh, a parallel course of issues of mental health, uh, social isolation, increase in suicide rates, increase in opioid overdose uh, rates, increase in setbacks to kids' education and the need to attend to their recovery. And then something I've called health debt, which is really chronic diseases that are getting out of control because people were afraid to go back to the healthcare system or chronic diseases that weren't even yet diagnosed because people were not connected with the healthcare system. And the reality of uh, what we're seeing today, which is abundant admissions to hospitals for non-COVID reasons, but they are filling up those beds and requiring a lot of resources. And then of course, we now had with Delta, the onset of monoclonal antibody, an actual therapy for the disease. I'm always hesitant to refer to that because people in the anti-vaccination community use that as an excuse for not getting vaccinated which uh, still is not a valid way of thinking. And here we are now finally at Omicron, a uh, place most of the world didn't think it would get to. It's only been here a few weeks and it's made quite a statement as we all know. Uh, I do believe that though more transmissible, its severity probably is lower than Delta. And that comes from some experiences nationally and around the world. The uh, ability to evade the vaccine is true, but again, even very, very recent data shows that even though you may have a higher probability of becoming what's called a breakthrough case, meaning become infected or just test positive, you are very highly protected still against the severe outcomes. And we've shown lots of data to that effect. You know, recently a 24 fold increase in. Uh, hospitalization and death rate if you're not fully vaccinated versus if you're fully vaccinated and boosted. I bet I already alluded to the impact on our healthcare system, and we're seeing not the influence on taking up a lot more beds because we have bed capacity. It's much more the health of the healthcare workforce. And for that matter, even emergency and other infrastructure, vital infrastructure personnel. So it has a major impact on society and schools, as we've all seen. It probably will help us in our march towards when this becomes endemic. So mitigation at this point in time, again, continues to be the hygiene uh, basics, the masking indoors being strongly recommended, the highest quality masks being, I think, much more fiercely advocated for now than ever before in the pandemic. and. Uh, uh, real attention to protecting the most vulnerable. As you've learned from our school guidance, we're back to where we were in that early slide in the beginning of the presentation. Traditional contact tracing is very labor intensive. It can be very delayed. It relies on traditional PCR testing, which isn't a rapid response system by and large. Um, and so containment becomes more of a fleeting, hopeful, uh, thing to achieve as opposed to something that we can actually count on like we did earlier in the pandemic. We have got new isolation and quarantine guidance, which we've derived from the CDC guidance, but we have made more protective in Vermont with testing options. And that does balance, I think, the need for aspects of the workforce to get back to work uh, and not adhere to the older, longer days of isolation and quarantine. Rapid at-home testing is an important strategy right now um, to manage life. What do I do today? Go to work, go to school, go to an event, as well as to manage spread. And it's much more effective than traditional surveillance testing could ever hope to be. 
you're hearing things from even Dr. Fauci and all national leaders now. The question is not if you will get infected with Omicron, it is when. Uh, that sounds very grim, but again, if you're fully vaccinated and boosted, it shouldn't be something to fear to a great extreme. We continue to uh, have the imperative to maintain in-person learning and uh, continue to uh, see evidence for pandemic fatigue, though certainly I don't want to overgeneralize that. Gathering size limitations are still important. We haven't set strict numbers, but we've been very clear through Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's about the fact that you're best off with one household. Multi-households are getting more dangerous, and certainly a 25-person Christmas or Thanksgiving table was ill-advised. Um, we will never relent on providing uh, pressure, but also pairing that with opportunity to vaccinate and boost. Travel restrictions, I think you'll all agree, looking at the colors of maps around the world and in the country don't make sense very much at this time. People are still thinking they've reached endemic. And uh, I have had to constantly remind people for months now that we are not there yet, so they shouldn't necessarily behave in that manner. And then we've made, um, obviously, we've done with state employees, um, vaccine mandates with testing out options. There are issues that the Supreme Court just brought up again about mandates for vaccine, or at least mandates about proof of vaccination for the ability to attend certain activities and have certain freedoms in society. I'll close with just sort of the public health toolkit of what is out there. It's all the things I've just mentioned, so I won't belabor the point uh, on the personal and the distancing and the stay home of sick. Obviously, this is a time we don't give up the masks. Uh, and the issue there is of course, recommendations versus mandates. <laughs> There's testing. Uh, which is still a prime part of everything. And the population clearly has bought into that very broadly. Um, and we are making daily more rapid at-home options available. Vaccination as talked about just on the previous slide, gathering size, stay home, stay safe is obviously an option, though I would never invoke that at this point in the tail end of the pandemic. Um, but that's the public health toolkit. And let me stop there. I think I did 10 minutes, hopefully, and will give us plenty of time for questions for myself and importantly from Dr. Kelso. Uh, thank will, you very I, much. I will stop sharing so we can- Yeah, that's good. Uh, that was great timing. Uh, you've given us a lot of information. We appreciate a little bit of the history and then coming forward. I, I would like to ask once we get the screen down, I will have some questions. Stop screen sharing. I don't know. I, I know. I was right. I'll, I'll, I'll work on too. it. You, you, start, you start asking <laughs> while I work on it. It's, uh, oh, you it's did happened. it. You did it. Okay. Oh, terrific. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Levine, thank you. And just for both you and Dr. Kelso, uh, a really uh, a very profuse thank you for all the work that you have done and you continue to do during this pandemic uh, is greatly appreciated. Uh, I am gonna start with uh, the, the question, of course, that we all have in our minds. And that is, and I, I know it's, this is probably a question you can't answer, but um, the bill we have before us is a mask requirement for the state in public places. And your uh, opinion, position, on that policy. Do you want me to give you a chance to talk first? I, I, I've certainly answered the question as well. But. Thank you. I'm Patsy Kelso, the state epidemiologist at the Department of Health. Um, you know, we, we were talking, Dr. Levine and I, about some data this morning um, in, in other states that are uh, starting perhaps to see their Omicron surge uh, plateau and start to decline. You know, we need a bit more data to confirm that. But, you know, thinking about whether they currently have or have in the past had mask mandates. Um, and from what we can tell, it doesn't seem that 
mask requirements are tied to what Omicron is doing. Omicron is highly transmissible. The reality is it's going to burn through populations fairly quickly. It's what we've seen in South Africa and to some extent UK and other states in the U US. And it's gonna infect a lot of people and then go away. And with Vermont's high vaccination rates, we do expect that's what we'll see in Vermont because we are highly protected. Um, there's fewer places for the virus to reach, but it's going to reach a lot of people and then burn out. And I, I don't know of any evidence that a mask requirement will impact that to any great extent. So, and and okay, I can just ahead. piggyback onto that. Um, don't get us wrong. There is great medical literature that shows that mask mandates work. Okay. However, that's almost exclusively pre-Delta and definitely pre-Omicron. These are faster moving, highly transmissible variants. The um, health, state health officers in all of the states that have had mandates, I have talked with. Some of them have been very successful. Some of them have had no impact. All of the state health officers have commented on the impact on the population and the discourse that occurred. And the fact that it was very challenging to obtain compliance. I heard you talking about enforcement and compliance and issues like that. And that they thought that it was aggravating the polarizations that were occurring in their state. Now we know Vermont is very different of course, but the reality is um, it's not a simple thing as saying, this is an evidence-based thing and it works and go for it. My fear right now, to be honest, is that Omicron is out of the bag. And if you invoke a mandate now, you may actually be able to show that in two or three weeks, cases go down, but they probably will go down in two or three weeks anyways, maybe sooner based on some of the Southern New England data that we're looking at. Uh, so it's gonna be a challenge to demonstrate the intervention is associated with the outcome. So uh, thank you for that. I'm, I, I'm going to finish my questioning and then we'll move on to other members. Um, the, the prediction of a peak in two to four weeks in some places, two to, some have said two to six weeks for the Omicron variant uh, means that other people are going to get sick, that the healthcare system is going to be inundated and that so much greater pressure and stress will be placed on hospitals, providers, and patients. And so uh, the, I always get the sense, I get the sense when I hear comments that it's gonna go through our population that we're relaxing about this and allowing for that to happen. And yet we know that there are going to be chronic cases resulting, and we know that masks can prevent the spread and the size of the of a viral spread that goes from one individual to the other, and that would then limit the virulence of the disease going forward. So, I you know I hear what you're saying, Dr. Levine. I think it's uh, important. But when 58 percent of the of folks in the state of Vermont want a, a mask requirement, um, then that that for me that kind of limits and obviates the social uh, behavioral concern that we're talking about. Um, the the other thing I've heard, and Dr. Kelso, you can help me with this. I've heard a few things um, that the antibodies are not as effective with Omicron. I've heard that. Um, I've heard that. Um, other, well, I also, I, my observation that other states where vaccines have not been in, in place or are going through the same, we're, we're seeing the same thing. We're seeing vaccine vaccinated, not vaccinated. Um, and the more this virus spreads, you can help us with this as well, the greater it evolves and mutates. And, and so don't we wanna stop the spread of the viral particles so that we're, we're, we're maybe attenuating that evolutionary ch change and the infection rate and potential chronic condition and infection of the 3% of the population who is susceptible uh, because of their autoimmunity or other. So 
a lot of little questions in there for you to ponder on and answer. Thank you. I can address some of them. Um, I think your your question about um, about this burning through the population and what other states are seeing versus what we'll see. Um, you know, we are more, much more highly vaccinated than most other states. And um, this is definitely a pandemic of the unvaccinated. While we are seeing breakthrough cases, when you look at the rates of infection in Vermont compared to other states and the rates of hospitalization and the rates of death, um, Vermont's rates are significantly lower than just about everywhere in the US. So I do think that the high vaccination rate is making a difference in Vermont, whether it will mean that our, our peak and decline is sharper or not, we'll have to see. Um, but I do think the vaccination rates are making a difference. As far as um, the mutation and the, and the possibility for more variants, there will always be additional variants because that's what respiratory viruses do is they you know, infect people and swap genetic material and mutate all the time. Until we have very high vaccination rates worldwide, we're, we're not going to do away with new variants. And I don't think we have population numbers in Vermont, susceptible population numbers in Vermont large enough to really think that we'll have new variants emerging here that can you know, impact on a larger scale. I think we're going to see that happen elsewhere, but probably not in Vermont. And then my last question, uh, my, my first question was the use of antibody against Omicron and its effectiveness as compared with others. I'll, I'll let Dr. Levine speak to that. Okay. So <clears throat> we are not advising the use of any of the monoclonal antibodies that we've been standing by all along anymore because Delta is now such a tiny, tiny percentage of the cases. There's only one new monoclonal antibody that uh, is effective, Sotrovimab, which unfortunately is not being manufactured at high rates yet. So we have um, literally 160 doses coming into the state. So it's not a lot. Um, my second, I'll just make two other quick bullet points. Uh, the second bullet point is the fear you have about the variants you should continue to have, but not because of Vermont, because of the global picture. So I continue to worry that not only in the United States where literally you could draw a line and we have the Southern half of the country that has a markedly different vaccination rate than the Northeast, but then the rest of the world where some countries in Africa are maybe 3% vaccinated. Fertile ground for variant strains, that could eventually come back to haunt us here, but not because of what's going on with vaccination here. I'll make one, one comment. And then I'll, I think Senator Terenzini and Senator Hardy each have questions. Uh, but, but my comment is, regardless of the number of people who are unvaccinated in our state, A, it's important to protect them and, and having a mask requirement may well protect them from uh, further transmission to them. Then the other uh, comment, um, uh oh, it just went out of my head. It'll come back, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but just to say that, uh, that the protective measure, oh, and then having in place some kind of uh, requirement that is based on a trigger that is well known. So the CDC substantial and highest transmission, uh, and then moving to a level that is comfortable for the state with a moderate level over a period of time, would seem to me having that in place is, is a model that we can use should we see another more contagious or more devastating virus. Yeah, and, and I do believe that it's sort of a toggle off, toggle on um, policy, which is which if you're going to do a mandate is an appropriate way to utilize it so that it's not constantly in place. I, I do want to say one other thing that may make you all feel uncomfortable, but the reality of transmission of this virus, and, and we know this uh, throughout the pandemic, the probably highest risk place 
once there is a case established is in your own household. You're going to see cases transmitted within households. Um, and I doubt you're going to see people masking in those settings until they know somebody has become ill. And then the unfortunate re result with Omicron is that person may become so quickly infectious that there isn't time to actually follow through on masking within your own household. So it, it is just a reality, which um, I hope I'm not going out too much on a limb, Dr. Kelso, with that. We understand that. Uh, and we're, we're also concerned about protection outside of school where parents and children might, uh, you know, take it home. So um, Senator Terenzini. Hey, Senator Lyons. Um, thank you, Dr. Levine, Dr. Kelso for your comments. Uh, I was sharing with my committee members before you got on that just this morning, three of our four kids have tested positive for COVID. Uh, and uh, they're a nine, six, three, and one. So uh, the older two are vaccinated. The two younger ones weren't eligible. But so COVID uh, has never been so real to me, uh, of course, now that it's in our house. And, and like you said, Dr. Levy, I, I just, I'm vaccinated. My wife's vaccinated. I think that there's, you know, it's in the house and I, I don't think I'm going to escape it. So uh, I'm in my office with the door shut. So we'll see how that works. But um, I wanted to ask a question. Um, when we were using the monoclonal antibodies for Delta, were we finding, you know, really positive results with it? Or, or what was sort of the effective rate? Uh, and I agree with you, Dr. Levy. And I think that the excuse out there for the unvaccinated to say, well, I can get those. Well, I think it's sort of a weak excuse not to be vaccinated as well. But um, so what was the success rate of, of those, if you would? Yeah, so we were using uh, pretty much as many of the doses we got into the state as possible. Um, and anecdotally, uh, having great success. The, the final litmus test is knowing out of the, I guess by now, thousands of people that got monoclonal antibodies, what impact that had on their hospitalization, because the goal of giving the antibodies is to prevent hospitalization. And that I don't have an answer for at this point in time. It's a little harder for us to get that data uh, aggregated together, but that's gonna be the litmus test because that's what the antibodies are for. Obviously you treat somebody with antibodies and they don't get hospitalized, you go, wow, that's great but you don't know that that person would have got hospitalized if you hadn't treated them. You're trying to treat them very early in their course because they have a high risk of a bad outcome. Thank you. Senator Hardy. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, and thank you, Drs. Levine and Kelso for being here with us today. Um, I, I, you know, I appreciated your history you know, our, your look back of the last two kind of horrible years. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm frankly amazed that the two of you are still standing. I guess you're sitting, but um, <laughs> that you're still with it. Um, but uh, I think that uh, it seems to me that over the last five to six months, one of the reasons that Vermont has, has had this, the incidence rate that it has is because we were caught a little flat footed um, and that you know, Delta snuck up on us and we didn't do everything early on that we could have done. And now we're in this situation um, and I, I understand all the reasons you laid out and everything, but you yourself have said, you, you're, yourselves, <laughs> that masking works and that masking is an important mitigation standard. And that one of the problems that we're seeing right now is that people are not focusing as closely on mitigation. You said um, less attention to mitigation strategies was one of your bullet points. Um, and what we're seeing is, is the thing that I'm the most concerned about. We can talk about individual types of people in our, our population and how, how susceptible they may be, um, but, I'm most concerned about our hospitals and our healthcare system and the impact on, on that and a lot of our frontline, you know, EMS and et cetera, and our schools. Um, our schools are in crisis right now. And I agree that we wanna do everything possible to keep our kids in in-person education 
and it seems nearly impossible at this point. Uh, it's just increasingly difficult for schools and for healthcare providers. So where I'm at right now is that we need to be doing everything possible to support those institutions, and most importantly, the people who are in those institutions, the doctors, the nurses, the school teachers, the kids. <laughs> My kids are in school today. And you know, every time I send them off, I get a little worried and a little teary. And I want to make sure that what we're doing is, is supporting them with good policy and also saying, we've got your back as much as possible. And I haven't seen the state doing that as much as possible. And that's why I'm in favor of doing a statewide mask requirement at this point. Um, Cause we should be doing everything we can. Masking does work. You both have said it. Everybody in your position is saying it across the country and the world. And um, so I wanna make sure we have a clear mask mandate that's simple to follow and that shows that we're doing everything we can. And one of the things you did say, Dr. Levine, is that if we do have a mask mandate, one that sort of comes on and off with certain trigger points would be the most helpful. And I agree so that we aren't, aren't here every, or you're not up there every week trying to figure out if we're, we should keep it or not. Um, so one of the discussions we were having earlier was what those trigger points should be. Um, we've heard from healthcare professionals who are working on the front lines that they want us to have a mask mandate. We've heard from doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, et cetera. Um, what, what trigger points would you recommend? Knowing that you're not recommending, I, I hear you, you're not recommending a statewide mask, mate, but mask uh, requirement, but if we were to have one, what would you recommend as the trigger point? I think Senator Lyons articulated it pretty well when she referred to the CDC uh, levels of community transmission being substantial or high. Okay. Um, that's a pretty well accepted metric, so, if you will. Okay. So not anything about capacity in hospital, because that was suggested to us the other day. So hospital capacity or anything you think would be less either clear I, I, or easy or whatever. Well, you know, that's that's a delayed metric as well. So it makes it a little harder to use real time. Okay. Um, and then how long, if we did go with the CDC's high um, transmission, how long would should we keep it in place? How many days after we, we go down? So we were talking seven, 10, 14 days of, you know, what, what do you recommend? Uh, Dr. Kelso? Typically, um, we talk about two incubation periods. Um, you, you would wait two incubation periods before lessening any mitigation measures or calling an outbreak over, for example. So if we're still saying that the potential incubation period for Omicron is 14 days, that would be 28 days is what I would recommend. 28 days of being beyond high transmission rates. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, thank you both and appreciate you being here. Okay. Any other questions of clarification or information from our, our Department of Health folks? Uh, really glad you're here. At the information that you provided is helpful. And the questions that you've answered about our bill is also extremely helpful and we greatly appreciate it. And thank you for the good work that you're doing. I, I, you know, I think we all feel that, uh, you, you hear that from us and we'll continue to work together with you as much as possible and we appreciate your time. So. Thanks for having us. All thank right, you. Well, we'll be back, don't you worry. <laughs> Um, so uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, Katie, we'd like to come back to the discussion on the bill. We have left, uh, we have 12 minutes until we're on the floor. Let's spend five minutes uh, talking about the enforcement piece. And the more I hear, the, the more I think based on who we are in our state, that if we took it out, it might not be a problem. So I'm putting a suggestion on the table to eliminate that enforcement section. 
and I'm 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 totally open to discussion here. Let's do it. Go ahead. I think both Senator Terenzini and I suggested that beforehand, and so I I, I can't speak for him, but I, I can speak for myself in saying I think we should just remove that paragraph D and be silent to it. Is there any anyone who would like to speak differently to that? I know. Senator Hooker. I guess I just go back to the idea that if we have no enforcement mechanism, what is this law going to do? It seems to me you have a law and you have consequences for breaking the law. And I, I certainly agree that we need to be doing everything we can to mitigate the transmission of this of this virus. But I'm just, you know, are we doing everything we can? Aren't we doing everything we can? And I wish it were coming from another place rather than a law. Yeah, um, you exactly. Know. And uh, that's the thing that I'm really struggling with. Let me, let me ask this question. Um, if, I mean, when you read that enforcement section, for me, the, the thing that struck me was the $250 a day. Uh, I My question is, how about putting something like $10 in an incident? If that were in there, would that assuage people's feelings or no, it wouldn't. I'm looking at no, just yes, yes or no, yes or no. I think it's it's not necessarily about the fine for me. It's about the you know if we have a, a specific language about enforcement, then it, the the presumption is is that our law enforcement agencies have to be literally policing it. When we had the statewide um, mask requirement under the state of emergency, um, enforcement was more implied, and there were instances where it was enforced. But on an individual basis in the grocery store, you didn't have you know police officers going up and serving people tickets. There, the, the, the instances where it was enforced were more across an institution, a, a business that wasn't enforcing it or you know, an event that wasn't enforcing it. And so I think that- Okay, I get it. Be implied. Got it, okay. So Senator Hardy, you understand that this uh, reduces the revenue of the state. I'm, I'm not. No, you're it. on finance. I'm, I'm not you're concerned on finance. about that. I'm concerned about reducing the transmission of COVID. <laughs> so, okay. If you put a fine in, it'll have to go to judiciary. Oh, I know. So I'm, I'm fine with taking it out. That's why I asked the question at the beginning of this day, what would happen if that were out? And I, because I, I was thinking that maybe it shouldn't be there. So you have affirmed that position. Senator Hooker, we couldn't reach a compromise um, on that one. Uh, so there we go. I, I'm fine with taking it out because I don't know that it's gonna make a difference either way. All right, so here's my suggestion committee. Um, Katie, have we, have we responded to all the questions, uh, decision-making questions that we had? I believe at this point, yes, I'm ready to put together a new draft. All right, here's my suggestion. Here's what I would like for you to do, if you don't mind, um, to put together a final draft for us. And it will be a committee bill, uh, even though there might be some votes of no, it's a committee bill. And um, if, if it's a majority vote of no, then it's not a bill at all. Um, and then I'm, I would like to ask for Aaron, if you could put together a very short Zoom meeting <clears throat> with our committee when we are off the floor. And is that acceptable to committee no. members? Five minutes. No. What time do you start? I can make a decision on this in five minutes. Oh, you don't want to vote on it? No, not yet. What, do, are, do you want to vote later this afternoon? Can no. we do that? I mean, our alternative is to wait and vote on it. We could get together on Monday. What's the matter with wait? Tuesday? Oh, because then there's a whole floor time that escapes us. 
if we could advance it on the calendar. This, look at the time for this moving is very short. So I know that this is pressure. I know that we have worked a short time on it, but we have talked a great deal about COVID and masking and all the other mitigation procedures. So I am, I, I don't usually do this. I think we usually need time and I agree with you, Senator, but this is, uh, we've been through this a lot. Senator Hardy. Yeah, two things. I completely agree, Senator Lyons. I think we should, I, I hear you, Senator Cummings, it's it, it, it's a hard decision. And this is a public health crisis right now. And we really need to, if we're gonna have any kind of impact with, with this, we need to move it as quickly as possible. Um, the one issue is I asked Dr. Kelso for that, the, the time we had 14 days in there, she, su she suggested 28. Um, so I just wanted to flag that as, as a suggestion from the epidemiologist that 28 would be a more appropriate timeline. Um, but I, I, I think yeah, we should I, move this as quickly as possible. I think, I think either 14 or 28 is fine. I guess I, committee 28 or 14, raise your hand for 28. Raise your hand for 14. Yeah, I'm for 14. Okay, let's do 14, leave it at that. Uh, this does have to go to the house. Uh, so I'm looking for uh, the committee uh, agreeing to get together before Tuesday. We could do that Monday. We could get, uh, have- No, I'll Sorry. come in for five minutes. You're impeding my health, but that's fine. Well, five minutes. Uh, this is Today? the first day I've had a break all week, and I was oh. looking forward to getting a walk in, but oh. I will give that up for you. Well, you can go on the telephone and walk. Not on the bike path. Oh, yeah, and you can't vote. Okay, so, all right, Aaron, can you put together a short, a short meeting um, right after uh, we are off the floor, a Zoom? and send it out to us. And Katie, will you have something for us by then? So you're looking to meet today now. Yep. Um, I have a meeting at 1130 to 12 and then I can turn to this. Perfect. If, so, we, need to, we, if we need to, uh, can we postpone our Zoom to a time certain this afternoon and everyone takes a break from their meeting at three o'clock? I, I, that is going to be hard. We have testimony scheduled in finance that would be hard to right. postpone. Okay, Katie, we're, we'll 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 try it after the floor, um, okay. and let's let's make a time certain. Uh, let's make a time of twelve thirty. And does that get in the middle of your walk? Yes, but that's fine. Let's make it twelve forty-five. No, I, I need make it right after the floor. Okay. Or I don't get time. All right. Aaron's going to send the zoom out right after the floor. Katie, let's keep our fingers crossed. There's time for you to complete that.